Welcome to Unit 1 um, for the We the People National Invitational Challenge. My name is Christine Hull and I will be facilitating today. In a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves, followed by the students, and then we will begin the hearing. Students will deliver a four-minute prepared statement, followed by six minutes of judge questions. My microphone will be muted during the hearing, and I will be holding up one minute and time signs. I suggest that you use gallery view rather than speaker view. And I ask that all of our guests stay muted and their cameras off during the hearing. At the conclusion of the hearing, judges will give brief feedback to the teams and then we will conclude. Judges, the floor is yours now. Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> My name is Alan Brodman, okay, and I get to introduce this. Uh, I am a, I'll be introducing myself, the other teachers will introduce themselves. We'll ask that you then introduce yourselves and your teachers, okay? Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you guys. I am a teacher in East Brunswick, New Jersey. I teach high school. Uh, I have brought teams to the competition, the national competition. And in fact, my students were on the other side of the TV screen, as it were, um, last week. So looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. I'm Glypta Sangrider Jones. I'm with the University of Louisville's McConnell Center. I am from Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm really glad to be joining you all virtually today. I look forward to your presentation. Uh, I'm Tim Moore for the Center for the Study of the American Constitution at the University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers. And uh, Mike, that is a fantastic screenshot. Uh, what in the <laughs> world is that? <laughs> you guys are? All right, we're unit one from Fishers Junior High. These are our two directors, Mr. Mike Fossil and Mr. Tony Sturgeon, and I'm Noah Strawhacker. I'm Emerson Elledge. I'm Meredith Ober. And I'm Andrew Strawhacker. Excellent. You guys ready to go? Okay, so I will read the question. When I'm done, you may begin. Rights, natural rights, and republicanism, classical republicanism, may be said to be the main or the twin pillars of the American political tradition. It is hard for us at first to credit any suggestion that there may be some tension or problem in their coexistence. Do you agree or disagree with the author? Why or why not? What might be the tensions between these two principles? How might they reinforce each other? How successful has the Constitution been in reconciling the, these or those tensions, I should say. What evidence supports your position? Where does the third R, responsibilities, fit into our political tradition? You may begin. Our unit collectively believes that Thomas Pengel is incorrect and that the twin pillars of American government, rights and republicanism, are inherently in conflict with each other. As Locke and Voltaire wrote, any government, by definition, must limit the people's rights in order to prevent the state of nature. This limiting comes from the original social contract created in a society, when the people voluntarily give up their rights in exchange for protection. The conflict between rights and republicanism goes beyond the initial seating at the government's creation, however. Republicanism relies on an indirect form of popular sovereignty, where power lies with the people through representatives. However, when the people's faction and frenzy are able to get past those representatives and into the government, minorities within society historically have a tendency to be targeted with unjust laws and policies. The framers preferred republicanism over democracy because representatives would hopefully be able to mitigate and reduce this targeting. Republicanism is inherently always at odds with the people's natural rights. Our government attempts to resolve this conflict by following Locke's example and taking away as little of our rights as possible. However, it also acknowledges that all natural rights are infringed upon by the government. One of the significant dangers often associated with republicanism is, as Plato wrote, the tyranny of the majority. When greed and faction are able to work their way into the government, the tyranny of the people will likely infringe upon the minority's rights. The majority pays no heed to the minority's rights and only cares about furthering its own interests at their expense, as Publius writes in Federalist 10. But even though these two principles are at odds with each other, they both serve to strengthen our government as well. For example, Niccolo Machiavelli wrote that the stability of a government is based mostly on the happiness of the people it rules. Protection of people's rights in a Republican government will undoubtedly please them, which makes the people less likely to rebel. 
Our framers foresaw the conflict between rights in the government and gave us several tools to help us guard against potential problems, most significantly the tyranny of the majority. For example, the framers included Baron de Montesquieu's concept of checks and balances, separating the powers of judgment, the sword, and the purse into three branches. As Montesquieu wrote, this separation would prevent one branch from becoming too powerful and then abusing the people's rights. Historically, if two powers, especially the sword and the purse, were combined, the people would essentially be at the government's whims. However, these many structural successes have not always worked well. Many times in history, the United States has ignored the Constitution and has focused solely on the extreme protection of the people. Japanese internment during World War II is a perfect example of this, where due process and the 14th Amendment were completely disregarded in the name of national safety. As a result, thousands of Japanese Americans were forcibly uprooted and sent to concentration camps and suffered countless injustices at the hands of our government. Since the people in our Republican government are ultimately in charge and those with authority are obligated to exercise it well, the people have a responsibility to maintain the government. As a key part of this, the people should be educated in the functions of their government in order to elect the most qualified representatives. The major way this responsibility can be fulfilled is participation in government, namely voting. Voting is the means to self-government and republicanism, without which our government will collapse on itself due to inaction and polarization. As Plato writes, a government's very existence places moral and social obligations on those in power as well. Since representatives that are utilized in a Republican government have great shares of power, they have more obligations placed upon them than the ordinary citizen. Civic virtue is absolutely essential to fulfill these obligations, and a lack thereof leads to the downfall of a republic, as previously seen in ancient Rome. We have finished our testimony and are now ready for follow-up. All right, well, I'll start out. You've quoted uh, Plato as saying there's moral and social obligations. I'd like to add a legal proposal. I think we should have a bill of responsibilities. Am I great? Evaluate my proposal. Bill of responsibilities, what do you think? The Bill of Responsibilities proposed could not ever be enforced by law. Otherwise, the rights which have been viewed as unconditional by Locke and so many other political philosophers would be viewed as conditional instead. And can be in the Bill of Responsibilities could be used as a tool to target minorities and other unjust um, um, processes could occur. I think you also I think you could also look at, let's say on, on this bill of responsibilities, there's a responsibility of the citizens to vote, which is very crucial to a republic. This could never possibly work because citizens in our country, especially, are very uneducated, as only 26% of Americans can name the three branches of government. Forcing a citizen to vote could be dangerous because this is, um, this in a way could disenfranchise them if they're choosing well, not to vote. Let's, let's, be, let's just make an obligation to pick up trash. Let's, let, let's lower the stakes here from voting to picking up trash on the side. Uh, uh, how about that um, in a bill of responsibility? Well, Locke writes that the government should take as little uh, natural rights away from the people as possible. And this um, sort of curbs those natural rights more than is absolutely necessary. And mm -hmm. having natural rights is an inherently good thing, according to Locke, so it would be bad to require people to have to pick up trash off the side of the streets whenever they see it. Thank you. So am I hearing you right, and, and maybe I'm not, so you would put no limits on natural rights? No, so the thing is, in order to have a government, you have to at least infringe upon some of the people's rights, okay. most significantly liberty, because you can't really have a structurally sound government without laws. So if we don't infringe upon the people's rights at all in our so-called government, then it's not really a government at all. All right, well, let me, let me go in a completely different direction then, which is where I was gonna be going, but you tempted me with that question. So let me ask you this question. Um, and let's look at this from a broader, kind of take a step back from the, the ideas, the concepts here, or into the concepts here. You've argued that our system is both rights and Republican at some level, okay? Today, 
are we more of a natural rights system or more of a classical Republican system? And is that balance that we have today a good balance? So the balance that we have today in our government can be most no notably seen in the various Supreme Court cases throughout the years that are kind of regarded as the pantheon of bad decisions, like Korematsu, as we mentioned in our paper, and Gobitis. And most, if not all, of these cases at some level have the government or the will of the people infringing upon the people's rights or the individual's rights, in that case, more than necessary. So we have, so the people's rights have to be more important in a broad sense than the will of the majority in the government. So the people's rights have to always win out against the will of the majority or Republicanism. And as of right now, I would actually make the argument that we are more Republicanism than rights because our rights, especially First Amendment um, assembly rights uh, among several others outlined in the Bill of Rights, like due process, ha uh, have been violated in this pandemic. So uh, the government has infringed on our rights more than what's outlined in the Constitution. But, a, but an emergency, like, an, like a pandemic or like an earthquake, it always calls for some sort of new social contract, as um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, because in times of need, the government needs to infringe upon the rights more to protect the citizens. And the, this infringement is always good, but most of the time it is. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask a question, um, sort of more the philosophical, if you will. Um, the classical Republican belief was that Republican government would only would only work in small homogenous communities. So in your opinion, is, is that right or wrong? Does it only work in small homogenous communities? And what evidence can you use to support your answer? Well, in Federalist Paper 10, Publius writes that this sort of bigger republic that the United States would become would be an actual advantage because one of the many dangers, as we were in our paper, again, that um, is associ associated with republicanism is faction or the tyranny of the majority. Now, now he writes in Feder Federalist Paper 10 that these factions would sort of cancel each other out in a larger society with lots of states. I think you can look at our republic as you see that we have one, we have a federal government, but we also have state governments which can, which can more directly target the people's needs and target the people's common good better than let's say the federal government can because they have a smaller group of people that they are kind of, that they're protecting. So I think that um, you can see in our country that a Republican system works well because we have state governments. Okay. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna have the uh, judges give you some feedback and any judge would like to start. Sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, I like your first two sentence, Pangle's wrong. Uh, you, you let us know where you're, uh, where you're at on that. Um, I think uh, your use of uh, political theorists is, is quite impressive. Machiavelli um, invoking the stability standard um, your reference to, to other uh, to other thinkers, uh, Montesquieu. Uh, I, I have to. Uh, what I read, I really was kind of digging here is the occasional turn of a phrase, uh, the pantheon of bad decisions. Um, you know the pro But I tell you, one of the turns of phrases that really got my attention, and I really want another half hour with you on this. Every time there's a crisis there's a new social contract that's a provocative and i'm not sure i agree with it as stated but that's provocative and that's interesting and that's worth talking about um so th i all that to say uh there are you sprinkled this presentation both in opening statement as well as in the follow-ups with some uh thought-provoking uh ideas and uh, I think that's indicative of an understanding uh, that goes beyond the, you know, beyond the average. Um, uh, I, so I, I appreciated that tremendously. I do think uh, um, 
you know, I, I, I understand um, that you're a student of Mike Fassel and you're going to get a lot of political philosophy, but, uh, and, you know, to answer, uh, should we have people pick up trash with um, a Lockean uh, description, <laughs> I think is, is interesting. But having said that, just a little more, um, a little more detail rather than just at the theoretical level. But I mean, your understanding at the theoretical level is, is quite impressive. Um, but just a few more. Um, that is to say, come down off the ivory tower occasionally too, uh, and give us some. Um, uh, for simple people like me, I, I need to come out of that ivory tower. But uh, this is this is good. I'm glad that I got to spend some time. I, I agree that you all clearly demonstrated um, multiple use of, of documentation, con uh, constitutional evidence, appreciated the ease with which you did it in, in the uh, presentation and then in the responsiveness. I really liked the your statement as you really juxtaposed it as a conversation between majority rights versus minority rights. I think that was really helpful in terms of illustrating uh, across the board. Um, the the tensions uh, there and I appreciated really the ease I said that already but that just how easily you all have clearly studied and, and, and uh, contextualize this information and encourage you to just continue to take that forward again and as uh, Tim said in a practical way but also um, just uh, great job I really enjoyed being here and just uh, wish you luck in the future yeah, I, I'm not going to duplicate, but I thought, again, I agree with the other judge. You guys did a wonderful job, uh, particularly in the opening statement, taking a position, laying it out. You clearly um, have a strong understanding, both of the, the philosophical concepts, but their linkage into cases as well. And again, I'm sure this is an example of your teachers as well as your own intellects. So um, both should get significant kudos here. Um, the, I, I again, I, same thing. I put a big question mark. I, I'm not sure I, I accept the, the idea that there's a new social contract each time, but I would have loved to have the opportunity to talk about that more. Absolutely. Um, this is why, uh, very short, I hated this stuff when I was your age. Hated it. And I love it now. So you, you made me feel good in terms of your understanding and support. So I, again, all told, very nice job, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.